Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers, where we bring together Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary on the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, our all-star panel will discuss the coverage and fallout of these stories. A big political conflict in the offing as the city council faces a decision on how to fill the mayor-elect's District 3 seat. Santa Barbara's new pot law will allow five retail shops, but many other details remain undecided a month before weed becomes legal. A landlord renters city task force releases its long-awaited proposals and tenants did not get what they wanted. And a special report from newsmakers on the road correspondent <laughs> on how the political world of Bill and Hillary Clinton is coping with the Trump era. Our panel tonight, Josh Molina, political reporter for Newshawk. Kelsey Brueger, national affairs correspondent for the Santa Barbara Independent. Nick Welsh, executive editor for the Independent, and Laura Capps, nonprofit consultant and member of the Santa Barbara School Board. Thank you all for coming. Josh, as you know, the city charter, section 503, provides for the possibility that a member of the council will be elected mayor and calls for the council to appoint a successor. But that was written back when Triceratops and T-Rex roamed the earth and does not account for district elections. Do you agree with me that there ought to be a special election for District 3? Was I supposed to laugh when you said Triceratops? No, 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 that's all right. The the people watching are in the, the, hysterics. They will add that later. Hysterics, <laughs> yes. That's where the canned laughter goes up. All right. So, uh, coming Thanks up. Thanks very much, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> coming up, the council is going to decide. They're going to outline the process for filling Kathy Murillo's seat. And the city charter outlines a process which suggests that there are going to be interviews and an appointment, not unlike what happened the last time that this came up when Doss Williams was elected and they filled the seat through appointments and that's how we got Randy Rouse. That seems to be the most likely scenario. The city attorney supports that process. Of course, we have opposing perspectives on this. The district elections committee, they say that there should be a special election to fill the seat. Somebody who is representative of district, district 3 who's elected by the people. So that's the rub. What I'm hearing on the inside, Jerry, is that this is going to be an appointment process. There will be some people who will speak in opposition. There could be threats of litigation. Oh, there could be litigation, not just threats. Or there could be litigation. It's ready to go. But The question here, though, is, is Barry Capello going to jump in and take the case? Barry Capello remains, on the record, the lead counsel, even though... My close personal friend Barry Capello has told me that he's not involved. So they have former Judge Frank Ochoa uh, representing them now. I don't know that Frank Ochoa is going to fill the city's heart with such fear. Um, as Barry. As Barry would. No, he, he won't. Uh, I, 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 I think... You know, the charter is pretty clear. It says you appoint. The charter is for at-large elections. They the charter, been, they, they had the opportunity. Changed. They had the opportunity to change Section 503 the for district has, elections. Because the voters they, have to change that. They say, the council can't do it. Right. They have to put something on the ballot. And, right. and Ariel Colon. <laughs> don't don't last, leave out his middle name. Last, last March told them they needed to do that. They did not. And now we are in this fix. So when would the appointment be? Jerry, this is what people don't like about some journalists. You're trying to set the agenda. You're trying to spin it into something that it's not. Perhaps. The appointment process is what it is. Josh, you are such an institutionalist. <laughs> I cannot believe it. Not, but that, it's not bad enough that the Democratic Party I've been called has a lot of things. <laughs> oh, yes. Kelsey, I, I, I'm know, on the Democratic Party's speed dial. Yes. <laughs> as you We're know, to a good start. District 3 <laughs> is the single most majority minority district in the city. Mm -hmm. And therefore, is it not a bad look politically, if nothing else? for a bunch of people down at City Hall to, to appoint their representative rather than letting the people decide? Well, how much is it for a special election? 
couple of bucks. It's no, twelve hundred votes. No, oh, no, don't no, tell no. me three hundred thousand. It's three hundred thousand bucks. Get out of here. <laughs> well, how can it cost three hundred? No, that's what R E L says. It's three hundred thousand dollars more. Than the the county would charge to have it, but oh, this would only be a for a single district, so it wouldn't be that much. Twelve hundred bucks. I mean, twelve hundred votes. What do you think? You're a you're a democratic uh, uh, representative kind of person. You believe in <laughs> democracy, <laughs> unlike the elitists who think we ought to have an appointment. Don't I'm you? more curious about who would run and what Josh is hearing. Who who the, would run? First of all, this system was created through a democracy. We elected these people, they set up this process, the charter was set up, it was voted on, this is what they wanted. You, okay, so let's do a special election, okay? It's gonna cost a lot of money, it's gonna take time. They gotta run again in a year. Two years, right? Well, I mean, you gotta start running a year ahead before the Besides election. Besides, they're gonna push it back to even your elections, right? That could happen. Are yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's gonna happen. That's what's right. state law, right? It's not, it's not state law, but it may as well be. Um, the Attorney General, issued some fatwa that said if you don't do even your elections, you're mm -hmm. going to be in trouble. Um, so it, it, the council has no appetite for getting sued. They also, the, the voter turnout goes up sh hugely. So it's like, how can that be a bad thing? The argument against it is that people go, oh, you only care about the Senate, the presidential races, and, and the city council races won't get the attention that they would otherwise get. As well as the school board district races. Right. Of which there were none last time, correct? I wish there were. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the other question. There is no vacancy as of now. And next Tuesday, the council's going to take it up. And they can, sure, Josh, they can go along with you and your elitist views and, and decide to <laughs> appoint city somebody. Charter. It, the city charter is totally irrelevant to okay. this case. Let's remember that quote. That's <laughs> when I do the hit piece on you when you run for office. It's gonna oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We're going to freeze it. And we're I'm just afraid. Turn I'm that afraid. Into a meme I'm right afraid there. my Super Bowl parties from the '70s and '80s will make that. But but seriously, the uh, there's no vacancy. The vacancy will occur on January 9th when Kathy takes the oath, and that council will be the one that will decide the process, will they not? And they could overturn anything that this council decides. Yes, I mean, basically they want to do this so that people can start planning, people who are interested, get the ball rolling. Of course, the new council can come in and decide to change that if there are those votes. It's gonna be the first test because we're gonna only have six and somebody's gonna to have to break the tie if they do decide to appoint. We're gonna have three against three potentially, as was the case with Randy Rouse until Grant House decided to vote for, for Randy because he didn't want somebody else to, to win. But that's going to be the first test. And maybe the, the threat of a lawsuit, an actual lawsuit, will force them to do something differently. I don't honestly think that the result is going to be much different either way. It has to be somebody from the district. And there's not a whole huge throng of people saying, I want the job. But... If, if you want to follow the charter uh, the way it is, then the person who finishes second is supposed to get the job. Therefore, Sharon Byrne, who finished second to Kathy in the last well, election the charter in their does, district, the charter doesn't say that. The charter says the council has the right to appoint the next highest vote getter. What they did with Babatunde Foliemi when he came in fourth, when Marty won the seat, and he was up technically appointed. I was in the room. They voted to appoint Babatunde. It was not automatic. But to your point about Sharon, I mean, yes, she would bring balance. She's smart. She knows and a lot. It would be fun because she would be in Kathy's face every week. But she doesn't have the votes on the council. I don't know that she can win an election either because if, she, if it were a special election, opponents of Sharon winning are going to organize very well and get behind a candidate. So. All right, Josh, we'll have to agree to disagree on this, I'm afraid. Well, that makes for better television. I guess so. <laughs> Kelsey, the council, speaking of the council, is still lurching toward trying to finish the pot ordinance. Um, what's been decided and what has not been decided? Well, um, we got sort of the first glimpse at where the council is going last week, just before Thanksgiving, and uh, they decided that they are going to allow five retail shops 
um, which was significant. I think the that's industry... All, that, that's sort of surprising. It was sort of surprising. I think the industry was saying, we want four or five. So the fact that they went for five, um, you know, there are three, actually two, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries that are undergoing the process. One is going to open at any point now. Um, the other one is still in the process. So. I, I, the, the thinking is that there's not going to be seven just because the market won't be able to support that, um, but it's a possibility. I'm very confused <laughs> about the taxation of, about this. The, the state is going to take 25%, is that F right? Fifteen. Fifteen percent. And mm -hmm. then local jurisdictions can charge whatever they want, mm -hmm. but they charge it on growing distribution, retail, right. they can charge well, they it can decide. Point. Yeah, they can decide to charge it at each step of the way. And what they're going to have to figure out is how to charge it. Are they going to charge a percentage of profits? Are they going to charge square feet if, if it's a cultivation, you know, acreage or, um, you know, of a greenhouse, for instance? So where are they now on that? Uh, both the county and the city are going to be coming back to that in December. So. And the county can also tax separately. Um, than the city, right? Yeah. Right. Well, you'd be in the unincorporated area, and so the county is ma mostly going to be uh, looking at cultivation, and the city is going to be on the the retail side pr predominantly. Did the city pay uh, twenty pr up to twenty? Well, the, this, yeah, that's true. So the <clears throat> so the, all of this has to go before the voters as well, which is another piece of this. But When's that going to happen in June? Well, the city has already voted on it last year. Oh, sort of, they right. snuck that on the ballot, twenty yeah. percent. So it's, that's an up to twenty percent. The council can still lower that amount. And based on last week's um, meeting, where they seemed um, to sort of cater to the desires of the industry to some degree, it seems like they are poised to lower it pretty considerably. I've heard five to eight percent. Oh. Now, one thing that's really interesting about the city is that it, the role played by the assistant to the police chief, Lori Lunau, a guy named Anthony Wagner. What was he pushing for? And why in that is meeting? he doing it instead of somebody from the planning commission or something? Well, no, it is unusual. I mean, he is, um, yeah, part of the police department. He has a history of working in a, uh, on the planning commission in the city of San Diego. He's not a sworn officer, is he? No. Yeah. No, he's was a civilian. he not trying to get into the marijuana business himself in San Diego? I don't know. Yeah, that's what I. That's, that's what, what I you heard. heard. That's huh. what I was told. Laura, are, is there concern uh, in the school district? <laughs> I heard. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about you have a high standard. <laughs> <of journalism laughs> yeah, I, I heard. heard. I don't know where I heard it. But it's going to be know another I lawsuit. I know where I heard it. <laughs> Come on He's phone. a public figure. You, you know, in my family, if three Welshes say the same cockamamie thing, it's a fact. Well, there you are. It's an alternative fact. Yeah. I'll bet it's true. How about that? He was a consultant who I think was, I don't know if he was trying to get in the business himself. I think he was doing some consulting. Okay. He is an expert on the so issue. So he has some background. That's why he's handling it. He's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway. It must be nice to run an independent blog, Jerry. I am accountable to no one. <laughs> Is there a concern uh, in the school district about the proliferation of marijuana uh, in, in the city and how will it affect Absolutely. the young I minds? Mean, uh, it's, I, I don't have the statistics, but kids get caught smoking pot um, and get expelled for it, probably the most... Of any, right? of, of any reason to get expelled. Really? Yeah. yeah. Again, that I don't have the statistics, but I think that's my, been my experience. That's what you've heard. That's what I've heard. Uh, no, but in my in my experience on, as a school board member for almost a year now, that's been predominantly um, illegal substances is the reason why kids get expelled or get suspended. It's suspension. Right? Yeah, yeah. They used to, when my kids went to school, they were suspended. But oh yeah. Well, you 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 don't just automatic. You don't get the um, you would get it suspended three times before they right. get expelled. And even the word expels, expulsion, you have the ability to come back and you're not, you know, it's sort of, in, when I first started on the school board, I thought, oh my gosh, like, 
if you're gone, you're gone. But we actually, there's a, you know, we work with the families and they figure out a different placement and they have the ability to come back after the year's end. So, Are there conversations yeah. about how the legalization is I haven't been? heard it through the district, but I know that Councilman Dominguez, I believe, has raised, like, where, where, the, um, mm -hmm. where the retail shops will be and if they're close to neighborhoods and close to schools. But doesn't the, doesn't the ordinance provide that they, they have to be a certain distance? They have to be um, 600 feet. Uh, away from a school. And so if you look at a map, uh, for instance, on, in Milpas, where Dominguez did point out that there are quite a few K through 12 schools, um, it, it, what he was uh, trying to do was to get that um, the boundary expanded to increased, so 800 feet. And that would actually wipe out quite a few potential locations for a, a retail shop. Uh, he was and not successful. Helene Schneider said 200 feet is not going to stop kids from being exposed to a marijuana storefront yeah. right. uh, but he was trying to, he was trying to get more distance because there's a there's already one on Milpa Street or one that's going to open up and there are those schools there and mm -hmm. Bendy White then said hey you can't be protecting your turf Bendy right? White an ally of Jason Dominguez well, not on that issue not on the he, do, do you not agree with me, uh, Nick? I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that Dominguez's actions in this, uh, in this case are, are a, a case study of the kind of... Uh, Law following feather bedding? Parochial, uh, yes, pedophagery we're likely to see within all districts. I think he's actually being very representative of his democratic of, election. Of his district. Yeah, of yeah. his district. No, I mean... When the first sort of uproar over pot shops uh, erupted, it was along Milpa Street. And he has always been tight in some fashion with the Milpas Community Association. They have led the charge historically against pot shops. Uh, and it's an issue over on Milpa Street. Okay, so uh, earlier this year, uh, the council uh, organized a blue ribbon task force of landlords and renters to tackle a whole bunch of difficult issues that they didn't want to deal with. Did you attend all of these uh, meetings? It, it seems so in your very comprehensive yeah. story, which I did not Finish reading. read on news. I must have missed it on news. You're the only one. Uh, I was the only one there. And, you know, I, and I was the only one who read the whole story. So. I read it. I read it. It took a while. It, it, was, in, it, it yeah. was interesting. You, you was, may have read, Jerry, a few years ago that the effort to share media across platforms <laughs> didn't but work out. Exclusivity, exclusivity is, dead. is dead. Well, so, yeah, I was the only one in so that what, meeting. What, what are they recommending? So, basically, what they're, to boil it down, so... 60% of the people who live in Santa Barbara are more rent. And so we're, we talk about housing and all this stuff. Typically the argument is over ownership and development. And uh, Frank Rodriguez and Cause said, hey, what about all the renters? The you know, ten tenant advocate. It's a tenant advocate group. And um, the council said, okay, let's put together this huge menu of options. And then Ariel Colon said, hey, why don't we talk about rent control too? Because that's one of the things. Everybody, all of the landlords went crazy. It, it, when it went to the council, it was like, what, in June? There was, the landlords got there early. There, were, there was hundreds of them. When the tenants showed up, or the tenant advocates showed up, all the seats were taken. So the tenant advocates had to go outside and listen on loudspeakers. They kicked it to this Blue Ribbon Task Force. First meeting, which I did attend. No, I didn't attend them all. The first meeting, the landlords are saying, problem, what problem? Vacancy rate, your numbers, we, we, we don't have a vacancy problem. Mass evictions, we don't have a mass eviction problem. If, if you don't have numbers saying what the problem is, how can we possibly come up with any solution? Tick, 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 hawk, hawk goes. We get closer towards um, the election. The landlords are starting to think a little bit more tactically. Hmm, how's the city council going to go? Uh, how, what, what's the outcome of the election? And as it looks more and more like Kathy's going to win and Democrats are going to win, they started thinking, we need to make a concession. So the concession they came up with was okay. you have to offer your tenant a one-year lease. Mm -hmm. Why is wow. that a concession? Mm -hmm. Wow. It's that not much a, of a concession. It's not much of a, but okay, here's the deal. Let's say you are living in uh, an apartment over on the west side. That, you know, these Camarillo landlords are buying up. They come in, they want to get rid of the sort of largely Latino families that have been renting for a long time and bringing in city college students. Well, if you have a lease, 
You can get kicked out, but you can't get kicked out until During your lease expires. So it gets you more time. But that's not a just eviction. That is not a just cause eviction. So the, what they did sort of as uh, lip service, I, it was you know, uh, a gesture towards that. They, it's called, uh, anyway, uh, they say when your year lease comes due and your landlord doesn't renew the lease, you have to have what's called a conciliation meeting. And that means you get to sit down with the landlord and the landlord says, well, this is why I'm kicking you out. Or this is why I'm not renewing your lease. And you may not like it, and the results of that aren't binding, so the landlord can still do what he wants. Is there a third party? Or, or uh, that mediated? wasn't spelled out. So okay. it's, it's very, very mild, but it's more than what they have now. For millennial renters... Oh, there we go. I was wondering, this is taking so yeah, long. Wait, this is just like, this is a record. If you do, want. You, do you think that's enough, or don't you think that there ought to be a just cause eviction? Well, it, it seems, I don't know. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like that's super significant. I mean, I've seen a lot of places that have offered that already. I mean, that's, right. it, and typically, you know, you get offered a one-year lease, and then it switches to month to month, which can be beneficial to a renter if you, do, if you want to get out of your lease. So if they were afraid of the new uh, liberal council, uh, is that going to come come back to the to the council? So, so, yeah, that, are so, they going to be threatened by that? So they had they were supposed to have five sessions, and that wasn't going anywhere. So they expanded it to seven, uh, and it was a lot of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin sort of argument. I thought you reported it was eight. Uh, I think I said seven. Okay, but. Um, Ultimately, it goes back to the council on January 30th. So the new council will be sworn in. You'll have seven people up there. And whether that is enough... Unless there's a special election. Unless there's a special election. I need to correct Nick on one thing. These out-of-town investors buying up these properties on the west side, not for City College students, but for your favorite, vacation rentals. That's... Well, not anymore. Oh, I thought we'd be okay. in, though. If they're in, on, Ivy not in hotels. Ivy zones. Apartments. Ivy Apartments from Camarillo. They're buying up for city So more to come on this. Well, they're, they're going to more to come. They're yeah. going to revisit it. Okay. I know, but you. you I just, I just wanted to. It's the theme of the show. The VRBO, you know? the much needed VRBOs. Wouldn't you agree with me on that? <laughs> conflict, conflict. No, I'm not, we're not agreeing with you on anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as a former staff member of President Bill Clinton, yeah. you were privileged uh, to to attend. You're just back from Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, a big event that was marking the 25th anniversary of the election, which I imagine when it was scheduled, they expected that Hillary would be the president. So was the mood more somber than you expected? Yeah, it was, I mean, 25 years since Bill Clinton won. It was scheduled pretty late, actually, uh, which is sort of a Clinton thing that holds over. So, uh, but yeah, it was a great reunion, Arkansas and the Little Rock um, the presidential libraries, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting and fascinating. And it was, you know, incredible win. It was fun to kind of... How many, how many staff people were there? It was hard to tell because there were supporters of the library there, too. So all in all, it was about 800 people, maybe oh. a little more. It was a big... But I ran into a bunch of old friends, and so it was just a reunion aspect. And, and just to caught up in the nostalgia of that race and, frankly, the 90s. I mean, life was... Seemed a lot Life easier. Was better than <laughs> but how much did the but, whole? Oh, yeah. Is so yeah, no, it felt a little like, um, you know, after a death in the family, you still have to have birthday parties, and they're important. But it felt like, the, I mean, the grieving was palpable still. Because um, because of, of Trump, I mean, and, and was there a discussion yeah. of how to combat his madness? Yeah, I mean, they did this session between Bill and Hillary, and James Carville moderated it for all of us, and um, it was this this elephant in the room uh, that, I mean, they kind of kept answering questions about 92, but it would just lead into 2016. It just, they couldn't not sort of talk, they both couldn't not talk about it. Um, and yeah, and just kind of what they've been doing uh, and how they've been sort of trying to make sense of it. And, um, you know, Hillary made a little news uh, for the reporters that were there because Trump had just tweeted, tweeted about her that morning about how she was like the worst loser ever. So she hit back. It was just kind of like one of these... It was inescapable. It was so the 2016 loss was inescapable, even though it was important to take a you know the weekend and for these relationships. I mean, I wasn't on the campaign. I, I joined the White House later, but for those who are part of that campaign and to be in Little Rock 
Um, you know, I think when you have presidential campaigns in sort of remote, more remote places like that, it's really a, like to go back is really special for everybody. So, did you come away more politically depressed or less politically depressed? I don't know how we can't get more politically depressed every day. So I don't know if it's just because the days go by or because I was there, but I'm more depressed. But these are very, very active, politically active people. Well, yeah, and I, I should say, I, yeah, and I should say, I mean, that's. Uh, you know, being at the library and the presidential center that they have there and the graduate school and you learn all about the stuff that, I mean, life is going on for the Clintons, that's for sure. And they have such a foothold, I mean, such an active post-presidency. And so to be, you know, immersed in that is, was felt good and a reminder of all the work that they, you know, that is still yet ahead for this this family and all the people that are associated her, her with Her book is very good. Her book is really good. I've been reading it. Yeah. Uh, it's honest. It's uh, So she's kind of like that. I went to a book signing for her and... Um, uh, you know, she's 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 not wallowing, but but at all. But she's also um, it's just again, it was hard to celebrate um, so soon after this. And speaking of elephants in the room, did the did the issue of sexual harassment come up? Uh, no, it did not. It didn't really. really? No. I mean, certainly uh, we were all talking. I mean, how can we not, as people and consumers of news, all be talking about sort of all these revelations? But no. But not about Bill. No. Okay. All right. Um, what? So did she wallow in in her loss again? As some people have accused. Well, her? the book I had, again. The book is great. She talked about how she did for a few weeks there and these long walks in the woods and all that. But she's been busy, and that's clear. I mean, it's she's remarkable. I I came away feeling impressed um, with how she's her resilience and strength that we've. I mean, I've always thought that about her, but and also the strength of their of their partnership. Yeah. All right. Kelsey, very quickly, who's going to be the next Second supervisor in District, District 2? Supervisor. Well, um, I, I don't know. Right now, I think um, the, the, the clear candidates are Susan Epstein and Greg Hart, and we shall see. Who will Janet endorse? I don't know. I wouldn't want to bet on that yet. Um, I think it's early, but... Uh, I think it, she could go either way, honestly. Josh, you, will you agree with me that with the support of high-powered politically uh, Democratic uh, women in uh, in Santa Barbara that Susan Epstein will trounce Greg Hart? I think that's what makes this race so exciting, <laughs> is that they are two strong, formidable candidates. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that was cow. And a third? Have we heard any other? A third? And there's going to be no more. Third. I think there, there'll be more. I bet there's like Why, why wouldn't Roger run? run? You know? He's not he, running. He's he's not, I know that. I know, but running. it just seems like a good opportunity. He was so bad last time. I mean, what about our, what about our panel colleague, Dale Francisco? I, people keep throwing around his name, but I think there's probably a split within the Republican Party because I think some Republicans are saying, you know, we have a lot of sway here if we back one of the candidates, yeah. um, one of the two, as opposed to oh. put, bringing... Oh, really? They would do that? Yeah. So, well, some. some. Well, what's the huh. uh, partisan uh, split uh, in the district? Well, Democrats have a 23% advantage, and 24% are still uh, declined to state, so that's a pretty large So if there was a third candidate, it'd be a runoff, though, right? Probably. No. Probably, yeah. yeah. I would guess. Oh. I think the undecided are voting for Angel. <laughs> <laughs> Whether what or I, not he was. what I was told. That's what I was told. That's Josh Molina, kicking them when they're down. So thanks to tonight's <laughs> panel, Josh Molina, Kelsey Berger, Nick Welsh, and Laura Capps, and thank you for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, where you can check out my regular blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond. Thanks to our director, Oscar Gutierrez, to our crew, Andrew, Anthony, Ryan, and Mark. And as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer at Freund. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time for our special end-of-the-year show when our Newsmakers panel will recall the biggest stories of 2017 and tell us what will be big local news in 2018. Good night.